Hey, blessings to you. It's Mike Miano, pastor at the Blue Point Bible Church, and this is our fourth try at this video. So I'm praying that this is going to work out, and we're going to be able to bring us through chapters 9 and 10 of Beyond Creation Science, what we're calling a part 7 of the study that I have been doing here live on Facebook, uh, also have been posting on my YouTube channel, and also making available through my blog, mianogonewild.wordpress.com, which I do encourage you to visit, because there you can find these outlines that we've been using at the Blue Point Bible Church to best enhance our study as we've been looking at the different subtitles found throughout each chapter of the book Beyond Creation Science. So prayerfully you have your copy out and you're ready to dive into some of the details with me regarding chapters 9 and 10. If you don't mind, since it's my fourth try on this video, I just want to open with a quick moment of praise and prayer to the Lord that this is working out and trusting that those of you that are going to be tuning in will be edified. And of course, praising Him that His Spirit moves us from leaning on our own understanding, instead studying and cleaving to His truth. Let's pray. Mighty God, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you that you have indeed provided everything pertaining to life and godliness. This morning, Lord, most notably what we praise you for is the spirit that illuminates our minds, that allows us to set our eyes on you as the author and finisher of our faith, that allows us to move away from leaning on our own understanding, but cleaving to your truth, Lord, and glorifying you uh, by living in that truth. Lord, be with us as we go into this study. Edify us. Allow us to continue to move away from our presuppositions, presuppositions and paradigms, Lord, that may not glorify you, but instead that we would prove all things, holding fast to that which is good and abstaining from that which is evil. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I see I got some people tuned in. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to uh, check out this video. Again, I'm bringing us through chapters 9 and 10 of Beyond Creation Science. I might admit right up front, these were not my favorite chapters of the book. Uh, if you've watched other videos, you've been following along, <clears throat> you know that I love Beyond Creation Science. These two chapters, I felt, um, added more insight, of course, and information to our study, but I, I did not necessarily feel that they were necessary. Um, the first part of chapter 9 brings us into talking about the Old Testament background and how important it was to understand how the apostles of Christ's day came to their understanding of the details. This is what they say right at the preface of chapter 9. The New Testament contains many references to Noah's flood. These references show how the biblical writers accepted the flood story as a real event that happened in real history. But they also reveal something else. The flood passages give us insight into how Jesus and the apostles understood the flood event. By looking at what they said about the flood, we can learn about what the New Testament teaches about the scope of Noah's flood. Any remaining doubt about the scope of the flood can be settled by the divinely inspired commentary on the flood that we find throughout the New Testament. So they bring us into the Old Testament background talking through uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 26. Um, if anybody can just write a comment in the comment box and let me know that if you are tuned in that you can hear me and that this is working out. Again, I make mention of that because this is the fourth time I've tried to make this video today. Um, so they bring us into understanding the Old Testament background and this time clock, if you will, that is put before us in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, where the Lord did say to the people of Jerusalem that a time was coming, a time had been appointed for them, that desolation and judgment would come upon them. That's me summarizing it, of course. Um, there would be 70 weeks, and this is a uh, time clock. Thank you, Richard. Um, this is a time clock that uh, methodically ticks down as we get to the time of the first century. These 70 weeks were a window uh, that were winding down, uh, moving toward the events of the first century. And uh, that's important because, again, that's where we see this flood that Daniel chapter 9 speaks about, that the days of war and desolation would come like a flood. And that's what they have us holding on to as we move through chapter 9, that these New Testament disciples, apostles, if you will, understood the prophecy of Daniel and understood that theirs was the day that the war and the judgment of the Lord and all the details that prophecy pointed to would be fulfilled. They would see the fulfillment of the 70 weeks. So the next thing they do in Beyond Creation Science is bring us into the Olivet Discourse comparison to the flood. There in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, we read Jesus Christ saying this, But the, as were the days of Noah, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days of before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. 
so also it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. They go on to take those words and compare them with what Jesus says in Luke, right? The um, correlating passage, if you will. In Luke chapter 17, verses 25 through 30, uh, Luke's record of Jesus speaking about these things, this is what it says. But he must first suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they brought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You see, the presence of Sodom in the Luke text implies that these are all talking about events that are similar. So therefore, if what we've been positing, that the flood of Noah's day was a local flood, now we find comparison, that it will be compared to the days of Lot. Days of Noah, the days of Lot, the days of the coming of the Lord. All local events with worldwide ramification, eternal ramifications, if you will. What they say here in Beyond Creation Science is perhaps the best way to honor the comparison Jesus makes is to accept that the local physical destruction of Sodom, which destroyed them all, is like the flood event which destroyed them all, which is like the coming of Christ and the local events culminating in AD 70, which destroyed them all. Furthermore, they say this, if we apply the same logic to all elements in the comparison, we would arrive at the conclusion that the flood destroyed all the people in Noah's world or culture. The destruction of Sodom destroyed all the people in that world or culture. The and the coming of Christ destroyed all those remaining in his Jewish world or culture of that generation. They talk about why Sodom is important to prophecy. The element of Sodom, so explicit in Luke's account, is completely absent in North's analysis. Again, North Gary North being a, uh, I believe, a uh, local flood or young earth creationist. Uh, Gary North. So um, he has, he kind of ignores the element of Sodom. In Luke's account, it is completely absent in North's analysis. This is merely one example of the general tendency among global flood advocates to avoid all the different details of the folk, uh, the prophecy. Their focus on the supposed universal scope of the flood causes them to overlook the significant role that Sodom plays in prophecy. One of the things in the preterist community that we like to bring up in regards to the coming of the Lord, right? We know that the coming of the Lord occurred in AD 70, in that generation. One of the things we bring up is that in Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, uh, the people of that generation are told to flee to the mountains, to flee this time of tribulation. If we're talking about a global great tribulation, how does one flee? That, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, what we see here is a comparison. Bringing in the story of Lot allows us to see what Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, verse 31 through 32, in regards to the God of the Lord. Remember Lot's wife. What they say here in Beyond Creation Science is this. Lot's wife was destroyed because she had a longing to return to Sodom. Jesus is telling his audience to learn a lesson. They too would be destroyed if they gave in to their longing for an earthly Jerusalem once the armies surrounded the city. The reoccurring temptation in Christ's generation was to return to Judaism, to forsake the gospel and to return to Judaism, a human works-based view of salvation which unfortunately runs rampant in our day. Paul and other writers in the New Testament are warning their audience of the dangers of returning to Jerusalem and Judah, and I'm sorry, and uh, Judaism because of the coming destruction that is about to happen, the coming of the Lord. We see in 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 9, and chapter 3, verses 6 through 7, um, this, another correlation in regards to Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's Ark, and the first century. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. If God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, 
For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment until the day of judgment. Furthermore, in chapter 3, verses 6 through 7, by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Noah's dead. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. And we know in Second Peter chapter 3, it speaks about the burning up of the element, elements, the stoikion in the Greek. The word stoikion, we know, is not a word that speaks about physical things, but rather this flood is going to burn up the elements, this flood of fire. I don't know how you court make that make sense. This flood of fire, which they would have understood, allows the judgment, the burning up of the elements in the destruction of the war of the Jews, Romans and the Jews, in the first century in A.D. 66 to A.D. 70. In the book, they say this, in Beyond Creation Science, in regards to the use of the word flood, because again, we're seeing the use of the word flood in Daniel chapter 9, and then Jesus comparing his coming as a flood. Flood is used by God several times in Daniel chapter 11 for an overflowing army crossing a boundary and sweeping into a land. We see this in Daniel chapter 11, verse 10, Daniel chapter 11, verse 22, 26, and 40. Here also the flood is parallel to war, and its terminus is going to be like a flood. The reference to the flood must, however, remind us of Noah's flood, which destroyed the whole world. The coming event will end old creation and bring in a new one. And again, that's a quote from James Jordan, who is not a preterist, but definitely has some preterist leanings. So what they do in Beyond Creation Science, they begin, us, begin to bring us into talking through the details of the rainbow. The rainbow being a very unfortunate, misunderstood thing um, in regards to Bible prophecy. You know, when we see the rainbow in our day, everybody gets excited. And they say, look at the rainbow. It, you know, it represents that God will never flood the world again. Well, no. If you believe in a coming of the Lord that's going to yet happen in the future, that's been compared to the flood. So, for as in the days of Noah, so will be in the days of the coming of the Lord. Now, I, yes, today I can look at a rainbow, and I can say that with, with glee, that the Lord will not bring judgment upon the earth any longer, because he already has judged the earth, and he's hung up his rainbow, so to speak, his bow. A bow is a symbol of war used throughout Scripture. Matter of fact, they make that known in the book. Um, they take passages such as um, Genesis 9, 12 through 15, they correlate it with Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, and also uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Remember, the rider carries a bow. What does the bow represent? It represents war. Uh, matter of fact, Jamison, Fawcett, and Brown, they say the significance of the rainbow like this. No external sign could have been chosen for this purpose more suitable from its natural properties than the rainbow. Its rundle, or part which should look toward the object aimed at, is always away from the earth, showing thereby that it does not aim at men. Sorry, I have a call coming. I want to make sure. Okay. Um, showing that it is not pointing toward men, and it has no string, which shows that men can see with this rainbow is that God has hung up his weapon and he's not bringing judgment upon earth. It's a symbol of friendship and of peace as made known through the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary. So this foretold the time that God would not, the rainbow foretold the time that God would peace with his people. Now, another thing that in chapter 9 is the talk about all mankind. I want to encourage you in your own time to do a study. Go ahead and go to Google and put in, does all mankind mean all? Does all mean all in the Bible? Does all mean all in the Bible? And when you put that in, you're going to find a whole host of articles that are going to make the case that the best way to understand what we're calling universal mankind language, when it sounds like it's talking about all men, um, we, what we need to do, and hopefully we've already demonstrated that through this study and the other videos that we've made, is that the context determines the universality. The context determines whether it's when world is used. It's not necessarily always talking about the whole world. Remember, Herod had done a census of the whole world. That whole world was from Jerusalem to Rome. It wasn't the whole planet. The way the biblical authors are using it is determined by the context. So that's important to understand as we look at the scriptures and discern these details. So then what they 
they do is they basically bring us into understanding that the local flood view, that you understand the flood is a little event that brought forth cataclysmic uh, worldwide ramifications. Again, God's judgment was upon his people in that old covenant. And in the new covenant, God's judgment has been rendered. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. So all does not necessarily mean all. All are not saved. We're not universalists. We understand that those that are in Christ are saved. It's important to understand those details there. Um, I'm going to read two quotes from Bernard Ram and one from Gary DeMar. Because again, this is what demonstrates the importance of understanding a local flood and then local understanding local fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Bernard Ram says this, The flood was local to the Mesopotamian valley. The animals that came, prompted by divine instinct, were animals of that region. They were preserved for the good of man after the flood. Man was destroyed within the boundaries of the flood. The record is mute about man in America or Africa or China because it had no significance upon them at that point. Now, that's the beginning of the Bible. Local. Noah's flood, local. Dealing with the covenant people. New Testament, we say the same thing. Gary DeMar notes this. Keeping in mind that the tribulation described by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 was local, confined to the land of Israel, the tribulation had reference to the Jews, the people of Judea. It is not a worldwide tribulation. You see how we just bring together the bookends of Scripture. I love how they say this in the book. They say, if you think carefully about these two views at opposite, opposite ends of the Bible, it is not hard to see that they both handle similar biblical language according to the same method of interpretation. From the waters of the flood to the fires of AD 70. Beautiful bookends of covenant context in regards to the scriptures. One thing they make at the end of uh, chapter 9 is the point that they have not used science to discredit a global flood. Rather, they've just challenged you to read the Bible. To actually know the context that is found within the Bible in regards to the flood. And then in chapter 10, I'm going to kind of sum this up here. In chapter 10, they move us further in the text to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, where we read about the Tower of Babel. Another misunderstood text in the Bible. Most people understand the Tower of Babel to be local. The significance of the event was local. Maybe the ramifications many people would believe were global, that all the languages on the earth are confound. That's not the significance of Roman, um, Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11 is basically highlighting that after the flood came upon Noah's generation and they came off the boat, these people who had been given the truth of God did not cleave to the truth. Instead, they wandered after idolatry yet again, even after seeing such a cataclysmic judgment as the flood of Noah's day. So what do they do here in Genesis 11? They begin to build a ziggurat, if you will, toward the heavens, an ancient pagan way of bringing yourself to God, where we know the contrast, as they make known in this chapter, the contrast in the scriptures is that God makes himself known. We as Christians cleave to what we call a revealed religion. God made himself known to us. We love him because he loves us. We know him because he revealed himself to us. We cleave to him because he pulls us toward him, what we call in the sovereign grace community, irresistible grace. So, what we're seeing here in chapter 10 is that this, um, I'm sorry, what we're seeing here in Genesis 11, chapter 10 of Beyond Creation Science, is this Tower of Babel is local, and it's representing idolatry. It's actually a defiance response to the flood. Oh, you want to bring judgment upon us? We will build high, and we'll create the outside with tar. That way, it will, uh, which is what coded the outside of the ark. Interesting correlation there, right? Um, this, uh, this tar would make it waterproof. And their goal was to ascend to the heights of heaven by their own efforts. And if God's going to bring forth judgment, we will prevent it by putting tar and building high. And you see the judgment that God brings forth. That's why God looks at this. This, this whole story is a story of idolatry. Matter of fact, you may not know this. Early on in America, um, they used the Bible to teach history, uh, math, English, etc. I remember when I had found out about the New England Primer. The New England Primer uses the Bible to teach children the alphabet. Amazing. Here, there's another um, American history book that explains the story of Babel to children. I want you to listen to what they say. Somewhere in Babylonia, the people built a great tower called the Tower of Babel, which you probably heard about. It was more like a mountain than a tower. Some say that the Tower of Babel and others like it were built so that the people might have a high place to which they could climb in case of another flood. Sure enough, Josephus, he says this. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. 
He said that he would be revenged on God if he should have to mind the drown, if God would drown the world again. For that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Now the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod, and were to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. And they built a tower. It was built of brick, cemented together with mortar, made of bitumen, that it might not be able to admit water. Interesting stuff. They do bring us into a, a comparison of um, the flood and the people, and you know you, you get some interesting details when you look at the Septuagint and um, what we understand as our Old and New Testaments. Um, you see some different details brought out um, in regards to uh, the people that were alive, uh, the gaps that are found there, and you know some strange, deeper study. Um, if you know we're not already making the case for a local context, a covenant context. Um, maybe you should go and look at those things. Um, these weren't my favorite chapters of the book because I believe that we've already made the case for a covenant context. These chapters affirmed, um, you know, different details that need to be understood. The progeny of Noah. When we get to Genesis chapter 11, really what we're seeing here is the progeny of Noah had not remained true to the covenant faith of their forefather, Noah. The story is about apostasy. Through the folly of Nimrod, they corrupted themselves with the religious practices of the nation around them, which were not affect, directly affected by the flood. This, this is what kindled God's anger and why he came down in judgment upon Babel. This idolatry is the same reason why he comes down upon the first century city of Jerusalem and the Jews. To end the chapter and to end our study, this is what they say in chapter 10 on page 185. God cursed Babel and confused the languages of the people by scattering them over the faces of the earth. At Pentecost, the curse is removed by God's Spirit as it is poured out in fulfillment of God's Old Testament promise about the last days. The Jews gathered in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. You see all this universal language being used. This refers to a particular local region, the world known as the Roman Empire. In contrast to Babel, where one language was confused, at Pentecost, the languages from every nation under heaven become one in order to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's grace at Pentecost trumps over God's curse at Babel. And it also gives us in information, what we're seeing happen at Pentecost is going to undo the problem of the Old Covenant. It's going to undo all the curses and is going to provide a new rainbow for the people of God, if you will. A new rainbow, our rainbow, Jesus Christ represents that bow being hung up and that God would not wage war. That's what Romans 8, 1 is highlighting. That there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. At the end of uh, the book, they kind of talk about, because this is the problem people get into. They begin to say, well, if Noah's flood was local, what does that mean for me? If nobody says that about Sodom and Gomorrah, because we've already accepted that. We just ignore that Noah's flood is compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we, can, we ignore that the coming of Christ is compared to the days of Noah and to Sodom and Gomorrah, local floods. So people would say uh, local events. People would say things like this. How can the Christian faith relate to people on every continent of our globe if the Bible does not speak about global events with the flood or the coming of Christ? If these events were all local in their physical detail, then why should anyone accept Christianity who lives beyond these biblical lands? Gary DeMar makes an interesting challenge to that. How would this line of thinking apply to the crucifixion of Christ? You're a Christian who believes, Gary says this, you're a Christian who believes in the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, a Lord who was crucified locally, locally. It happened in a local environment in a dingy part of the world that nobody noticed. But you and I are redeemed by what happened in the past, a local event. And we could say the same thing in regards to AD 70. Dr. Don K. Preston says this, does an event have to be of universal scope to be universally significant? In other words, does an event have to be geographically widespread and widely known about to be truly important? You see, the geographical size or even the scope of the knowledge of an event has no bearing on whether it is universal, universally and spiritually significant. Fewer people know of the death of Jesus than knew of the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century. The destruction of Jerusalem would have had a far, far wider impact socially, economically, militarily than the death of Jesus Christ. Should we then argue that the fall of Jerusalem was more important than the death of Jesus? Surely not. 
Should we likewise depreciate the significance of the end of the Old Covenant age because folks in South America did not know that it happened? Surely not. And what he's speaking about there is the coming of Christ. If local implies insig insignificance, then what would that mean for the Christian faith? The best way to understand God's ways is to understand his acts in redemptive history, even as local as they may have been. The best way, I'm going to end with this point, the best way to understand Bible prophecy is to understand how God has acted in times past. And it's usually in a very local event that has worldwide ramifications. This is how they end chapter 10 of Beyond Creation Science. Many Christians in our day insist that the flood, Babylon prophecy, refer to global events. Preterism introduces a key principle of covenant context that offers a coherent understanding of Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, and New Testament prophecy. Preterism may very well revolutionize the Genesis debate. And that's our end. Uh, what we did here this last past Wednesday at the Blue Point Bible Church is did a review. So what I'm going to be doing this next week from probably later on this evening up until about next Wednesday is I'm going to be putting out questions on Facebook. I hope you'll contribute right in the comment box. Um, different ideas and thoughts in regards to each one of the questions and then I'll be summing up our review next Wednesday with the video and giving you all the answers to the questions that I was putting out. So we're going to stop at chapter 10 and then also this is important we're not going to begin our study again until the first week of November so we're going to take a break to review chapters 1 through 10 of Beyond Creation Science for the entire month of October and then begin again at chapter 11 um, the first week of November. Thank you for taking time out of your day to tune into this video and I trust that you've been edified by this resource. Praising God for Beyond Creation Science. Go in peace. And again, I'll make mention of mianogonewild.wordpress.com where you can gain access to the outlines that we've been putting out for this study. Thank you again for tuning in.